what I'll be talking to you about is the work that my lab is trying to do. Um, and this is sort of the aspirational goal to transform outbreak response in the genomic age, is the kinds of things that we, we get passionate about. So in the 20th century, uh, starting around 1940s, 50s, people started really describing a lot of new viruses that were emerging. Um, Zika in 1947, uh, uh, Lassa virus is one that we care about in 1969, Ebola in 1976, and then there was that big explosion of HIV AIDS in the 1980s. It, there were so many different viruses that were being described that it led the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, to publish a landmark paper um, called Emer uh, um, uh, Emerging Infections, Microbial Th Threats to Health United States. And really, they, that's where they coined the term emerging disease, but it was the sense that there were these new viruses that were popping up all over the place out of nowhere and trying to understand why these things that were either new in the population or rare to the population suddenly became such a huge threat. Um, and, you know, when you think about these emerging diseases, we're thinking about them with the kind of newspaper articles and the threats going around the world and the sense that we are encroaching on animal habitats or otherwise engaging in animal products and that we would know when these viruses are coming about. But my lab and I really started to get the sense that actually the true face of an emerging disease is far less clear. It's, it's just, it's sort of what you might see in a quiet village with a mother and her child and somebody is ill and ailing and no one knows why. And the way we started thinking about this, uh, why we started to kind of wonder about this was not by being in the field originally, it was by mining the human genome. I was a postdoc with Eric Lander here at the Broad Institute and I was developing tools, algorithms to go through the genome and look for footprints, footprints that occur when an uh, uh, some ancient pressure happens, some arms race, some, some race for survival between us and the environment. And a new mutation emerges that's somehow beneficial to our survival or our reproductive success, um, and it'll leave a pattern, this footprint, in the genetic architecture of that region. And we can actually look for those ancient footprints by looking for specific patterns that you can see in DNA and the relationships that it has with other mutations in the region. And the footprints are actually quite large because what happens is a new mutation rapidly rises in population and takes with it the whole chunk of the genome along with it. But we can try to then develop other tools to identify exactly where that mutation is within that region that's driving it. I won't go into detail with all of those different kinds of methods. In the past, I've shown you kind of how all that's done. But in essence, I just want you to know that that's there's a, there's a type of tool that we use, statistical tool, to look for those mutations. And when we started looking for them, we found resistance to malaria or lactose tolerance, um, changes in pigmentation, all the things you might expect to be those sort of ancient adaptive pressures. But one of the ones that really surprised us early on is we were studying a population from Nigeria, and the strongest signal in that population, and actually in our first scan in that whole uh, in, in all the, all the data set that we're looking at was linked to a virus called Lassa virus that causes Lassa fever, which is a hemorrhagic fever virus, much like Ebola. And so it was surprising, um, you know, that we, we didn't know if that was the driver, but what's interesting is the signal was in Nigeria, the <coughs> virus was first described in Nigeria, so all this stuff started pointing to something interesting going on. But again, this is an emerging disease, one that in medical school I hadn't even heard about because it's really not well known. So how could this be such a pressure on human populations when it's really described as a new fever virus? A deadly one, but new. Um, and so in order to begin to study this, we had to go to the field, right? We made an observation in the lab, but we had to say, well, well let's go to the field and see what we can find. And so we set up uh, capacity with our uh, partners, um, international partners in Nigeria and Sierra Leone and partners from here in the United States as well we set up the, the ability to do diagnosis um, and detection of loss of virus and to begin to study the genetics of the virus and individuals who are infected with the virus to see what might be going on. And it's really important that all of this really required us to go to the field. It's where we get our best insights. It's where we can do the studies we want to do. And we started developing these deep relationships uh, over the course of the last decade. And we began to recognize as we started doing this work that it couldn't be done in isolation. If we you know, use genomic technologies to make discoveries, we were going to have to then translate those discoveries back to the clinics and the hospitals that we work at and, you know, with the international community. Um, and the more that we actually can provide them tools, the more they can tell us. Because, see, as we started going around and studying loss of virus, we started, you know, wondering that question, is this an emerging disease or isn't it? And what we found is actually as we set up the diagnostics to test for loss of virus, we started ca capturing cases. 
We started capturing the cases we might have expected by, looking at clinical data, but we started noticing that there were a lot of other people that had Lassa that were coming in sick to the hospital that were actually infected with Lassa that most people thought were malaria or typhoid or dengue or just something else. They don't have the classic presentation you might expect. And you actually start to realize that that Hollywood version of a hemorrhagic fever is actually more the minority, not the majority. And in fact, most of the people who come in with Lassa fever um, really don't have very frank hemorrhage or anything you'd see. Some of them don't even have fever. So we have to really think about how do we diagnose these things without the right tests to do it. And as we then started to look, we said, okay, well, this is interesting. This, we started noticing that it was much more widespread than we thought as we had the ability to look. And as more and more people started coming to the hospital, because we now had tools to help them. And then we started saying, is this more you know, prevalent than we think? So we actually just mined the literature. Other people had done a lot of work looking at seroprevalence surveys, looking to see if there's antibodies present that suggest that um, people have been infected with the, with the virus and other kinds of epidemiological studies. And what it started to show is, actually, it looks like Lassa virus is actually quite widespread. In Nigeria, um, here, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, there, uh, in some, you know, some places, more than 20% of the population had antibodies to Lassa. Some places, actually, even over 40% of the population. So suddenly, that started to make us wonder, are there, is this thing circulating, and are a lot of people resistant, uh, or a lot of people becoming infected with it and we don't even know about? And as we started mining the literature more deeply for hemorrhagic fever viruses themselves, we started to look at Ebola more closely as well. And we wondered whether or not Ebola was also circulating. So in 2012, two years before the outbreak, we published this paper in Science as a perspective piece called Emerging Disease or Diagnosis, Asking the Question. Were these diseases that we thought were emerging threats that were coming out of nowhere, are they truly emerging, or is this emergent detection of things that are circulating, that are already infecting people even widely, or, and have been potentially for centuries, if not millennia? And so this is a picture that the first author, Stephen Geyer, drew. Um, he actually originally took the picture while flying uh, over the Congo River uh, near where Ebola was discovered. Um, and he, in this he took the river, which he had taken, and then transformed it uh, using uh, uh, visual aids to look like the image of Ebola virus. And the sense was, if you look from a different perspective, would you recognize that this thing has been here all along, as old as the forest itself? It also has that sort of crop circle feel, which we were trying to invoke. Um, but just, you know, but, but fundamentally, we thought we can do better. The, one of the last phrases of that paper essentially said, you know, if we if we recognize these things are circulating now, we could actually start to study them in the villages where they're affecting people and start developing the diagnostics and, and different ways of approaching them. And we can not only help the communities that are affected today, but we could help create sentinel sites to ward off the next pandemic. And that was essentially what we'd gotten a lot of funding to start to set up just as suddenly we got this warning. In 2014, uh, in March of 2014, it was declared that there was a outbreak of Ebola in Guinea. It had been circulating since at least December of that year as some unknown virus. It actually took you know, many months to figure out what it was that was killing off so many people. And we were concerned because we work in Sierra Leone, which is near the border of Liberia and Guinea. And the Kenema government hospital where we work actually services both countries for diagnosis of Lassa fever. So this very porous border, it's all, you know, in some ways one kind of large country. And so we recognize that if Ebola was to come into Sierra Leone, and it likely could, that it would affect the uh, hospital that we work at. And so members of my team here on, the, on your right um, uh, joined Dr. Humar Khan and his team in uh, Kenema and set up the diagnostics to test for Ebola uh, in the patients that were coming to the hospital. And we allowed our partners in Nigeria, we provided them the resources to do the same. So we worked with both sites to make sure that they had the diagnostics in place to do the surveillance they needed to do. And they began to do the surveillance for, for the original month, and they didn't find anything, but on May 25th, they unfortunately did identify a case. A woman came into the hospital suffering a miscarriage, having gone to a funeral recently, um, and uh, the test came back positive for Ebola. And if this is the only case that we had had of Ebola, it would have been handled very, very well in the sense that the case was detected right away as soon as they came to the hospital. The woman was quarantined in our Lassa ward. She was treated safely. She actually um, uh, fared well, and, um, and nobody was infected. 
But unfortunately, at that same funeral, many other people were infected and actually had been circulating for longer than that. And before we knew it, we had hundreds of patients coming into this single hospital. At that point, the international community had been maxed out in Guinea and Liberia. So we were, the, these folks were alone fighting this disease for some time. And so it didn't come into Sierra Leone as this individual case. It really came in like a tidal wave. Um, and it really surpassed the threshold that any hospital could handle. At the same time of trying to drum up attention and get folks thinking about it, we did the one thing we could do as scientists, is we'd already had this relationship where we were seeking lasso, sequencing Lassa virus, and it set up the way to send the samples safely and have them sequenced. So we sent them to the United States and we sequenced them, and we released that data immediately to the web, because ultimately we were much more invested at this point in the charge. This is an outbreak, we were at the epicenter of it, and our colleagues were on the front lines. So we shared that data, we sort of rushed it out to understand what was going on, and, and submitted it to the world, and soon after published the data. And one of the reasons why we thought it was so important to release the data right away, and why we sort of worked to you know, get the information and the analysis of it is, that the virus was mutating. This is just a snapshot of mutations that happened in the first few weeks that we'd captured, in Kenema when the outbreak came in. And you can see that everywhere along the virus's genome, it's making changes, right? And so these viruses, it's not Ebola, it's not one entity. It's many, many different things. It's far more diverse than we are here in this room um, and, and beyond that. And even within this first few weeks, there are massive changes that were happening to its genome. And so we realized that we had to pay attention because all of the things that we were doing so, um, would be impacted. One of the first things that we could tell was by tracing the different mutations and looking at the phylogenetic tree of it, we could see that the virus had actually entered the human population once. So you can look at the family tree of a virus and get a sense of how it's separated. And we could say it actually entered the human population one time, and then from there was spreading from human to human. And the reason why that was really important was that early information about the outbreak really central was focused on where it was coming from the environment. Ebola had always been considered something that comes from the environment, so people were had signs everywhere, and the CDC pamphlets all talked about don't touch bats, don't touch monkeys, don't touch mangoes that may have touched bats and monkeys. Don't touch most of the food that these people use for subsistence. And so that was dangerous if we weren't paying attention to the right things and we weren't using the, our sort of public information in the right way. And soon after, really, the, the language started to change. It really began to talk about hand washing, covering yourself, not touching, um, contact tracing, and that was an important point is understanding the transmission of a virus will let you know how to affect change. It's also really important because the genome of a virus is essentially the blueprint that makes the proteins and also can be guided in every way. It's in you know, every version of that virus. The diagnostics that we use are either PCR-based and somehow or genome-based or protein-based based on fundamentally the, the genome sequence of the virus. Same thing with the antibodies. Many of these sort of monoclonal antibodies or polyclonal antibodies are based on the protein sequence, the vaccines as well. If the genome sequence changes, all of those things may no longer be sensitive or effective. Um, and that is why it's critical that we are releasing the data in real time and why we share it and use it. It also allows us to start to pinpoint mutations that happen. So early in the outbreak, if, as you may recall, at first it was sort of in Guinea and Liberia, but nobody was too, too worried about it. It seemed like it was under control. And then at some point, the trajectory changed. It went from kind of a slow rise to a massive rise, and it exploded. Right around that time, there were a number of mutations that popped up. And one in particular caught our attention because it was an alanine to valine change in the glycoprotein of the virus. So, and the glycoprotein is what is interacting with, the, uh, with our host receptors. And there's a mutation right at that binding site uh, where this would, um, would attach that's only uh, specific to humans and primates. So there's a change that happened in the primate lineage where other mammals don't have this change. The receptor looks different. And so we took a look at it, and we, we took a look at that mutation and its biological effects, and we saw that it actually increases infectivity of the virus, that if you have that valine change, the virus is able to infect more easily. And we also then looked at not just human cells, but other mammalian cells, um, like the other mammals and bats, which are the believed reservoir. And indeed, this mutation made it less infective to them. So it did, this virus had never had so many chances to transmit from human to human, and it seemed to be adapting to do so. 
So that's sort of, that's kind of the broader message of what we, the type of work we believe in and why we think it's so important is that genomics can really help us detect what we so-called emerging pathogens and identify them to improve diagnostics and treatments towards them and also track transmission and hotspots to really understand what they're doing. It provides all that kind of information. Ultimately, the most important information that we got from this is we have to act fast. Right, the kind of the most powerful things that we could say that anyone would know, but the data showed us is the virus is mutating. And so we don't have time to wait to see what happens. At any point, it can change and become more uh, volatile. And of course, this is going to happen again and again and again. As soon as Ebola went down, Zika became sort of hot on the scene because it was suddenly rising in the Americas. It hadn't really been described here before. We started seeing lots and lots of cases of, in Brazil. And importantly, it um, you know, seem to be connected somehow to microcephaly. And there's more and more evidence to suggest that, that that connection is real. That in essence, the virus is one of the few arboviruses that can bind to the, uh, can cross the placenta and can have some sort of an impact. And it is believed that this causes microcephaly. And so while it's not an epidemic in the sense of a pandemic, a fast moving thing, it is something that has become endemic and is quite frightening because of the impacts it has on pregnant women and their children. We originally didn't, we don't work in the Americas, we didn't work on arboviruses, we didn't work on Zika, so we originally hadn't done anything in this, my, my lab hadn't, and we looked to other people to kind of lead the way, but over time we started noticing there weren't that many individuals, uh, no, virus sequences weren't coming out, and we were trying to find out why. And it's because it's actually very challenging to sequence, and we, this is a place where a genome center like the Broad could actually have an impact. So we don't want to do everything, we actually very much don't want to do everything, we want local communities to lead the charge. But in places where it needs some kind of uh, some more technical guidance, we decided to jump in. And we immediately were able to form these rich collaborations. We'd gotten, we were used to thinking about how to collaborate well. Um, and so we were able to build, build partnerships to get samples from 10 different countries. And we spent a good amount of time banging our heads trying to figure out how to sequence this virus. Because unlike Ebola that suddenly makes lots of copies of itself and is really easy to pick up in the blood, Zika actually makes very few copies of itself and doesn't stay around a long time. The effects more are kind of the downstream effects of how we react to it. But over time, we had to assemble even a bigger team over a longer period of time, and actually many people who became jumped on later are not even in that picture. And we were able to make this phylogenetic tree. This is the kind of tree that we made um, for the Ebola outbreak to show us that this was transmitting from human to human. And this is just a phylogenetic tree that shows relationships between different viruses. And importantly, one of the things it does is in green is Brazil, um, and uh, in red is uh, uh, the United States, in blue is the Caribbean, and, we'll, and there are different countries in the other colors. And what we could see is actually that in the Americas, it likely, the American lineage likely came from Asia originally, but in the Americas, Brazil seems to be the most ancestral. So it probably did somehow sort of propagate in Brazil and seed these other places from there. Um, and you see it in the other countries, and then there's this, this kind of lineage that comes off of Brazil into the Caribbean, and it really kind of takes hold in the Caribbean. And from there, we see multiple different entries into the United States. So with ours, we found four. Another group found another four together. Collectively, we found five separate introductions into the United States. And the other group, uh, which is my former postdoc Christian Anderson group, then also did modeling to show that it likely has been introduced into the United States over 40 times. So this is, these things are keep coming in, likely from the Dominican, uh, through a lot of uh, tourism that was happening between the countries. And we could start to understand how is this coming into the countries, how can we stop it from spreading. Um, and one of the things that's obviously very important, and different things, genome data is important to tell us different things in different cases, but, but diagnostics are always really important. That, that we want to have the most sensitive test for diagnostics. And of course, there are a lot of women that are anxious in Florida and around, uh, around the Americas having children to understand if they have infection with Zika. And so we started realizing that these are places where there are different um, PCR primers that were designed to the genome. Um, and we are able to start to understand where the mutations happen, figure out which ones are the best ones, and just use the um, mutations that are happening um, to basically design assays that are more prone, are better at detecting things. So we can just use the genome sequence to make PCR primers better. But the other thing that we can do is uh, Feng Zhang's lab here at the Broad Institute um, has been one of the leaders of CRISPR, uh, uh, sort of the CRISPR revolution, and they're able to identify a CRISPR 
a system called C2C2 or Cas13A that's able to chop RNA viruses. And what's really powerful about the CRISPR-based system is it can be used for diagnostics and therapies. So, and, and therapies are down, downstream, we have to figure out how to do it safely in a human. But from the diagnostic standpoint, it's pretty cool. Because basically the way CRISPR works is um, the CRISPR system, which was originally an immune system for bacteria, is able to pick up on a sequence of, uh, of um, RNA or DNA, in this case RNA, and it's looking for a match of sequence. And if it sees that match of sequence, it cuts. Right? And that's sort of why we use it in the sort of that cutting device. But interestingly, this particular type of Cas13, uh, Cas protein, it has this thing called a collateral effect. Once it cuts the thing it, it found, like once it cuts the direct match, it then starts widely cutting anything around it. Right? And you can use that collateral effect, that wild cutting, to make it cut a fluorescent label nearby that's sort of attached in that system. And so you can actually use it to make a diagnostic, which is pretty cool. Um, um, and we've been working to develop uh, Zika diagnostic, and we published work with them and are continuing to do that to make rapid diagnostics. And then you can also obviously use that cutting to cut down the virus. You just have to make sure that it, you don't want that to have a collateral effect and cut other things. And so those are the challenges that we have, but there's some really cool things to happen there. And that's really uh, just an overview of the kind of some of the projects in our lab. And I'll just give you a sense of the other kinds of things that are going on in our lab. We really, we started with Lassa fever. We're still working on Lassa fever. It's, a, it's one of those viruses that's, it's sort of, I always call it, it's like that indie band that nobody knows about that you think is like really interesting and people should know about. Um, and this is, Lassa is like the connoisseurs. Everybody in the hot zone by Richard Preston like was obsessed with Lassa. Um, it's, it's that, that this virus is very interesting because it's so lethal, so widespread, um, and seems to have been around for some time. And so we've actually developed a genome center, that, um, a national genome center in the middle of the country in Redeemers University, and then have regional hospitals where we're setting up molecular diagnostics. And then we have that each of those have a catchment of villages that they are feeding in RDTs. We want to actually create a network, a hub and spoke model, where the information gets to everybody. Um, and the only way to do this is really by enhancing the skills of the people there. And so this is a one of our classes, last year's class of our, uh, our uh, Genomics of Infectious Disease program that we teach here at Harvard and the Broad Institute, and a lot of the cool videos that they make to sort of do training modules when they go back, and they're learning to be educators, not just to do the science themselves. Um, and we actually, so this is, we have the same model going in Liberia, Senegal, and uh, uh, Sierra Leone, um, and we uh, have our, uh, have just begun to start getting uh, individuals from Ghana as well, and uh, are expanding this program. But you know, they're not the only ones that don't know how to do diagnosis. Um, that ultimately in the United States, actually there's only, if you have loss of fever, there's only one lab in the country that could test you. It's at the CDC. And so you wouldn't know. And in fact, in England, uh, there was, right when I started this project, I remember multiple people died of loss of virus in the UK never being once tested for loss of virus. Because it's not on people's list. It's not easily tested. We don't have ways, I mean, when is the lab, can anyone tell me that if they, can anyone raise their hand if they've always known what, what microbe is infecting them when they've been sick? That you, you've always known what microbe is infecting you when you're sick, right? Most of the time, nobody knows. And you're just like, please, God, may this not take that long. You know, may this not you know, make me miss that party or the deadline or whatever. You don't know what it is. You just hope for the best. And that's not good. You really want to know, this is what I'm infected with. This is a sense of how long it's going to last. This is what's going to work. Why don't we know that? We don't know that anywhere. Um, and not just this, isn't, this, is, this is something that affects everyone. And so we're working um, with the state labs, the departments of health in seven different states in the, in the New England area. They've all come here for training as well, same kinds of training that we give to our uh, developing country colleagues. And, um, and they've been doing sort of sequencing with us and data analysis. Um, and we're looking after a lot of these tick-borne infections. So be very, very careful this summer if you're ever out in the fields. Ticks are on the rise. It was a very warm uh, winter. There are a lot of ticks, and the ticks have really bad bugs in them, like Powassan virus and Lyme disease and beyond. Um, and so we're, we have a number of projects with them studying the different things that are circulating. And one of the ones I think is my, one of my favorite projects is actually studying outbreaks just within our local, local community. So we, we, we we're interested in this like, global effect, but really uh, I work on the sort of outbreak surveillance committee for um, Harvard. So whenever there's an outbreak of something, we get in panels and we start doing lots of conference calls and try to figure out what kind of messaging we want to do and what kind of 
uh, regulations we want to put in place. And the last couple of years, mumps has been hot on the scene. And it was interesting because the dining hall that I was eating at at lunch every day because I teach uh, freshman genetics was like ground zero. And I was suddenly, you know, concerned by that. And I was seeing the data, but nobody else was seeing the data to say like this sports team and that sports team and this club. And, and, right, and what, what if we knew that, right? What, why is it that every single person when they're infected with a, with a microbe are on their own individual medical odyssey, right? They're like Googling by themselves in their room, you know, like sniffing. They're going to a doctor that has 10 other patients that have all their things going on. They're trying to get information. Why don't we do this like an investigative thing? Everybody feeds in, gives information to each other, and then you get, fe you get fed into the right doctor who's been investigating whatever's infecting everybody else. And so that's essentially what we're setting up. We've got an app going and a surveillance system, and we're working. And uh, anyone who's engaged in this, this is the kind of thing we, I love to get uh, you know, you guys involved in because you're tech savvy um, and you're, you're interested in knowing about yourself. But in essence, you could help yourself when you help each other, right? If an outbreak is to happen, fundamentally, if you look in the movies, we're all supposed to like punch each other in the, you know, in, uh, in grocery stores and try to like, you know, take each other's food and like yell at each other. But really, if an outbreak is to happen, it's like a giant game of, I don't know Pokemon going well enough to know, but it's a giant collaborative game, right? It's us against the virus, and the only way we win is if we help each other. And the second we start being divisive with each other, the second then people start kind of misbehaving or not, not being compliant and infecting each other. You have to actually isolate the sick, help them get better, and everybody moves on. So it's sort of a you know, big passion of mine is gamification of outbreaks. If it is to happen, we all should be as a partner team to make it work. With that, that's, uh, so that's an overview of the kind of stuff we get passionate about. This is my lab. These are the creative folks that make this stuff all possible. Um, and, uh, and every year we have a holiday card. This one of, uh, is uh, you know, a good one to kind of give, convey to you how awesome they are, how creative they are, and how they make my uh, job really fun. Um, and, you know, but it's not really just about one lab. Uh, it's not even about one team. Uh, it's not even about one field, that there's people that need to come. During the Ebola outbreak, we had partners from every, like so many different fields that we were working with, all of us having to coordinate with each other. And so it's a collective that we work on together. Um, the last thing, as sort of just having one kind of non sciencey thing to, to talk about, is um, that uh, you know, what's really awesome about science and why I like, love my job is that it's, it's a lot bigger than what you think. It's not actually you know, one person sitting at a lab bench by themselves isolated. It can be, and as a person who actually is naturally an introvert, I like that too. But it actually is collective. It's a collective community that you're part of. Because, um, you know, these are the women that we, I work with in Nigeria, and we're doing something together that's sort of bigger than ourselves, and we have to work together. And one of the ways that this has sort of shown itself really nicely is this is us in 2009, when I actually had to give a concert when I went back and I was there for three weeks and I wanted to practice so I put my, brought my guitar and one day I was practicing after work and they started singing and it was like amazing and then I started realizing they sing every morning when they start their days and we started this musical collaboration. In the end, we actually released an album together um, when they came to Boston. I recorded it. And, um, and the way that this particular song that I'm going to just show is like a clip of at the end came about was actually pretty tragic. It was in the middle of the Ebola outbreak we had a, one of these summer programs where a group of women uh, and men were here uh, visiting for the summer. And, what, and it, what, turned, what started as a general surveillance course turned into a prepare for Ebola. You're about to go back to the front lines. And so they were here training and learning all the diagnostic tests and we're getting them ready to prepare to go back on the front lines. And every week came chaos. Right? That, that was that summer when it started escalating. And uh, but we had sort of decided that we were going to like write music together. So we, I'd, my band and I had already recorded the music. We were going to just, or actually, yeah, we'd already recorded like, um, no, we hadn't. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. We just had a bunch of random like generic like uh, riffs that we had been messing with. And we had just decided that we wanted to go record something at the end of the summer. And so we, um, we just decided that every Sunday we were going to get together, me and uh, my guitar player, and a bunch of women in the gr group who were all singers, and we were just going to sing until we found something we liked, and we'd go and record because I'd booked this session. Anyway, middle of the summer, uh, one day we're about to go in and do our Sunday thing, and like the day before, we learned that like two of the nurses have gotten sick with Ebola. 
Um, and then I think I went into the session and I was getting to fog the whole thing. But in essence, then the head doctor also came down with Ebola. And then the women, and then in that week kind of uh, sort of leading up, it was that suddenly the women, the, the nurses had died, the doctor was sick, the doctor ended up dying. The, um, and then uh, my collaborator, Christian Happy, uh, diagnosed the first case of Ebola in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, a city of 20 million. So it was like one of the most cataclysmic weeks I've ever experienced in my life. And within that context, um, we had got together because we just said we would. This is something we did. It, it, you know, it was one of those things where you just you, you let everything else go. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't exercising. I wasn't doing anything. But I was always just showing up every Sunday to their dorm and just doing this singing thing. And on you know, one of those days, like, everybody was beyond just sort of beside themselves. No one really understood why we were there like, together to sing in the context of all of this insanity. Um, and we started playing some of like the songs we'd done before and like none of them really resonated and it was just sort of dead We were about to kind of close up shop, but then we took out this old like this riff this one like uh, Tune that we had and it just was uh, something all I had for it like musically was just uh uh yeah Yeah, so it went just it went uh 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 yeah 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 uh 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 yeah 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 uh 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 yeah 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 and I don't know what that was. It just was something I liked doing. And so I, I kind of had them do that for a little bit. And then suddenly, but for some reason, with the tune and the music, and they started doing the uh, yeah, like everyone's face lighted up. Something changed. And we were just sort of like chanting. And before I knew it, I wrote the song like right there in the session. I just was looking at their faces, and this thing came up. And it was, um, the song is called One Truth. And ultimately, like it just said, a lifetime that we write, we laugh, we cry, we breathe, we pray, we, you know, um, we are love, we dream, we scream, we strive, our hunger will never die, and I'm in this fight with you. And that's all sort of that came out. And then the, in the end, and, I, so, and then the course that kind of came out of it was, so I have a lifetime for one truth, that I'm alive and so are you. We are here, we are the proof. Uh-uh, yeah, yeah. So that was essentially what that song came to be. Anyway, so we just started, and that became the song. And at the end of the summer, uh, you know, after lots of things had happened and gone down, we did end up going to that studio. We did record the song. And the night before, literally the night before they went on the front lines, I grabbed my, I just decided we're going to just do a video for this. I don't know, I don't know where I get this, like, you know, kind of this has to happen in the middle of everything. And we recorded this video. And to kind of give that sense of we are depressed, we are scared, we are frightened, but we are love. Um, so this is just a short clip of that song. Oh, and this is Dr. Khan. This is who it was for, and this idea that, um, you know, when I was saying that, it was sort of, I was speaking to him across the ocean, and it was that sense of, like, um, I'm in this fight with you. And so everything I do really always comes back to him, of saying, you know, him and all of the people that were on those front lines, that they actually were in this fight with us always to the very end, and it's important for humanity that we are as well. And here's the clip. I'll just go from here. 